Welcome back. So today we are going to continue with our look at clocks. And full disclosure, I really think I should have taken yesterday's video a little further before I stopped because, gee, I've got a lot to cover today and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do it. So, just to stay on the safe side, let us assume that what we are going to be able to get through today is 19th century clocks. So, we will get started when we come back. One of the really interesting things about clocks is they are a very strange combination of mechanics and furniture. The cases of the clocks, and the picture we're looking at are tall case or long case clocks, the cases are furniture and they will reflect the furniture styles that were prevalent at the time. But of course, the mechanics of the clocks are completely different. That's just a totally different uh, category altogether. And so the mechanics will reflect the state of the technology at the time. And it didn't always blend nicely. So with that in mind, let's start taking a look at these. This is a very good assortment of the sort of clocks one would likely see in the United States at the turn of the 19th century. So that's like right around 1800. We can see that the clock on the left is clearly of an English design. It, it has a lot of Gothic elements in it with the barley twists, uh, the use of wood designs, uh, market, marquetry is very nice. The one next to it, and this would be uh, second from the left, is more of a French design uh, that also reflects a lot of the American styling at the time. Now, third from the left, we have a piece that is probably French. Um, and that, even though the clock itself is probably French, it very likely represents a lot of the styling you would have seen in American-made clocks. And the final one, the one on the right, is closer to the empire style, now that's a French term, or the Regency style, that's a British term. Um, in the early 1800s, France had an empire, Britain had a Regency, and they each have their own designations for the style of that period. So we didn't have anything. We had the War of 1812. That's as close as we came. But this is very likely uh, what you would have seen if you walked into the home of a wealthy family. Now, when we look at these, and uh, these, uh, the reason I chose this picture is because these clocks, which, by the way, I believe are reproductions, they very nicely encapsulate regional designs. The one on the left has a very English look to it. The one in the middle has a very American look to it, and the one on the right has a very French look to it. So you can see that styles, in addition to being dictated by the time frame in which they were created, are also very strongly influenced by the country in which they were created. Now, these are wall clocks. All of them, even the larger sort of long case clocks at the bottom. What you can see from this 
is all of these wall clocks were basically small long case clocks, small grandfather clocks. This is a wonderful image because this encapsulates virtually all of the wall clock designs that were available to people in the era from, say, oh, I'm just going to put a ran random number on it and say 1770 to 1820. That's what you would have seen. Now, in addition to the fact that these clocks were very expensive, the movements were often made in Europe and had to be transported to the U.S. It not only represented a huge investment in terms of money, but a huge investment in terms of time. It could take six months for a German clock movement to go from the watchmaker's table to the American home it would eventually live in. So we don't see a lot of style changes, and the changes we see are very superficial. Um, we're really not seeing major changes in the clock itself, just minor changes in the box it was housed in. Now this is just a stock photo, and it shows you a very nice sampling of what would have been available in the U.S. in the early 1800s. This is the period when we were moving away from that Chippendale broken bonnet top grandfather clock and looking at other designs, largely influenced by Regency and Empire styles, that's true, but these clocks were being manufactured in the United States and began to take on something of a characteristic American look. Now, these are the sorts of wall clocks you would have seen in the very early 19th century, and we are seeing some changes here. Yes, indeed, some of them do look like miniature grandfather clocks, but others like the one in the upper right, is starting to take on a decidedly wall clock kind of look to it. So here we are back at our Seth Thomas mantle clock. By the way, I don't know if that particular clock was actually made by Seth Thomas, but that is the Seth Thomas style. And these are usually called Seth Thomas clocks because of it. And at this point, we are moving further into the 19th century. Very, very early Victorian, um, still very empire. However, since we are in the United States, empire styling or even Regency styling are not going to be as impactful as our own clock manufacturers here. So here is another, this is clearly a modification of that Seth Thomas mantelpiece clock. And as you can see, our clock is now looking like our clock. It's not looking like something we borrowed from another country, another culture, another artistic tradition. Very American, sort of plain, no-nonsense, here we go. Although, quite frankly, if you look at this, it's really not all that plain. This is a style of wall clock, that sort of modified grandfather clock that was quite popular in the Empire period. I'm going to just label that 1820 for our convenience. Uh, again, as you can see, looks very much like a grandfather clock, but it's American, so we have simplified things. And here is empire styling. These empire clocks, they, they are often called neoclassical because in France, Napoleon's empire, um, he had a very militaris militaristic mindset for his country, 
and he wanted to forge a sense of imperial destiny for the people of France, and he wanted to do that by associating himself with Greece and Rome. Oh, and Egypt to some extent, but mostly Greece and Rome. And the way they did this was through their art, through borrowing classical designs. These clocks are really, really important in, in terms of their impact in the United States because the White House burned down during the War of 1812 and we, meaning Americans, had to refurnish the White House and we did it from France. France was our ally. England was our enemy. Remember, it was, the, it was the British who burned the White House. So the French were the good guys. The English were the bad guys. And the White House is chock full of clocks like this as a result. So very important for us in terms of that little bit of history that these gorgeous clocks, gilded, bronzed, uh, and the classical motifs. And remember, that was a militaristic thing in France, but we had no trouble adopting that here in the United States, brand new country, and we didn't mind the idea of associating ourselves with the ancient peoples, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, so that we didn't quite feel like such upstarts. Very, very important style in the early 1800s, largely overlooked today. Here is another. And as you can see, we have so many uh, elements in this. Uh, and some of them are, in fact, militaristic elements. Although in this particular design, it's mostly agricultural. Uh, and by the way, in the United States, the agricultural elements were very important, but in the style overall, no, it was the militaristic spin that was significant. Ah, here we go. Now, this indeed is militaristic. You know, we have, boy, we have like a winged angel who's going to come down and smite the enemies of the Lord. And, of course... That was not going to be us. We were American. Beautiful bronze clock. These clocks are really, really great. And I have to say, that is not my style. I would not tolerate a clock like that in my home. It would have to go into the back of a closet. No, it wouldn't. It would have to go in a box. It would have to go in a tool shed. But having said that, even though not my style at all, you really have to marvel at the workmanship. And here is another. Uh, this one is beautiful. It's gilding, it's marble, and of course, the images we have here are of scholarship. So, yeah, more, uh, more appealing in my mind than the militaristic images, but still, very nice piece. This was the height of style in 1820 in the United States. Now here is another type of empire styling. If you look at that, I don't know about the rest of you, but I can see so much Art Deco in that. Empire styling did incorporate simplicity of lines the and, and thick, heavy lines. In general, it did not favor uh, light ephemera. It was more substantial. This is a very classical empire piece. Very beautiful. And as I say, of course, it looks very much like something you would have seen a hundred years later in the 1920s. And here is another, not quite so deco, but you can see the classical lines with the columns and the little portico and whatever else. These clocks were designed to resemble Grecian temples. And here is yet another. Uh, 
And now, mind you, these are all American made. The last three that we saw, American made. And here in the U.S., we were inclined to go for the simplistic a little more. And you can still find clocks like this reasonably affordably. By that, I mean under $200. Uh, and frankly, if you want to put a clock in your living room, you know you're going to pay $200 for it. So my suggestion is go grab a nice antique. And this. This is an interesting piece. This is a wall clock. Uh, despite the French look to this, I believe this is an English piece. It was a very common style, and you would see pieces like this all over. This was a style that was, because it was smaller, was affordable. You wouldn't find this in a working class household, but it's the sort of piece that you might find in the home of a prosperous merchant who might own four or five clocks, and this might be one of them. So I thought we would depart from what we've been looking at so far, which is uh, French and English styling, and take a look at Scandinavian clocks. Uh, the clocks we're going to look at here are Swedish and Danish. So some of them are from the peninsula, but some of them are from the European continents as well. Scandinavian clocks had a very particular aesthetic. And as you will see when we go through, they were frequently whitewashed and they just had a certain look. Once you're through, Looking at the next couple of images, uh, you will be able to pick a Swedish clock out the moment you see it. And this one is, in fact, Swedish. This one is Danish. Um, and it's a little tiny bit different, but notice, still white. That was something the Scandinavians really seemed to enjoy. You would think they would get enough of that with their winters, but no. Um, this is also a Danish piece, as I recall. Again, closer to that old Swedish clock we saw, but still whitewashed. This piece, Swedish. Um, very interesting piece, very ornate on, on the top but very simple in its overall design. Here is another Swedish clock. Um, it looks like this has just been highlighted with a little whitewashing. Again, very simple, a very easily identifiable design. Now, we are going into Victorian at this point moving away from the empire styling, moving into early Victorian. Now, this piece, uh, first of all, you can tell from the inlaid wood design that we are getting into Victorian. This isn't the ornate high Victorian, the belter style. At this point, we are still in the early Victorian era. This is a mantle clock. We are still simple but they are dressing up that wood with a lot of very fancy work. This is another Victorian piece, and this is a Victorian mantle clock made in the Chinese style. Uh, the Victorians, well, England, which is where Victoriana all comes from when you trace it all back, England was at the height of its colonial empire. They had outposts all over the world, and they used to say, the sun never sets on the British Empire, and that was probably quite literally true. As a result, they were seeing items pouring in to England, into the homes of English people from all over the world, and Chinese items were remarkably popular. This is another example 
of a Victorian mantel clock. Very dressy. We still have some of those neoclassical elements. But in addition to the neoclassical, we have the Victorian frills. An interesting piece. Very, very early Victorian. This is another style that was popular in the Victorian era. This piece is French, and we would now call this an anniversary clock. They just called it a clock. They enjoyed looking at the mechanics of the clock, and if you turn this clock around, you can see all the gears on the back of that clock face. So this style, which by the way is still readily available today, I don't mean as antiques, of course, but as modern repros, you can scarcely walk into a department store without seeing one of these. So it is a style that was really popular and is really popular nearly 200 years later. Here we go, another very Victorian piece. We have ornate, man uh, ornate marble, uh, we have, it looks like bronze. I don't know if those are handles on either side. They probably are, but they are very decorative little vine designs. And at this point, as you can see, we are about to plunge into crazy Victorian fussiness. And here we go. Uh, this is Dresden porcelain. Uh, I don't even know what to say about that. My goodness, it could take me an hour just to describe it because there's so much going on there. This was the height of fashionability in the Victorian era. This is what everyone was striving toward. How much frill can we stick on our clock? And here is another one. This is a clock with two urns. Uh, and once again, we just totally gone overboard. But in fact, going overboard is what the Victorians did best. Meantime, this is what a Victorian long case clock looked like in the early Victorian era rather simple, sort of a transition from empire into the later super frilly Victorian era. We are still seeing a lot of elements that became popular in clockmaking in the United States during the period in which the best of the clocks were coming from Philadelphia and Newport and the cabinet makers there. And remember, they were influenced by Thomas Chippendale so they wanted that Chippendale bonnet on the top of their clocks. This is another. We're seeing some of the Gothic touches in this one. We are still not in the high, you know, Belter Victorian period, but we're moving there. This is a lovely clock. Uh, although, yes, there's no question that it's Victorian, it doesn't beat you over the face with it. And with this clock, we are moving much closer to what we think of as classical Victorian style, the high Victorian, the fussy Victorian. It's a very pretty piece, and believe me, they got a lot fussier, but this is very much what the Victorians truly loved in a clock. And also, keep in mind, as I mentioned yesterday, the cuckoo clock was insanely popular. All of that, that intricately carved wood and the mechanics of the little people and the little birdies coming out of the doors and singing and chirping and doing all kinds of stuff. And the Victorians did love their mechanics. They were crazy about that. They, they would go and pay money to watch little uh, automated um, novelties like automatons or um, what else did they, they would have little um, 
trick amusement devices, a statue that would move. A rather reminds me of Santa's Village at Jordan Marsh in Boston in the 1950s and early 60s. As a child, I adored that. And the Victorians, boy, it gave them the same sense of amusement and wonder. Well, at this point, I don't think uh, we are not. We are not going to have a chance to go through any more. And the reason for that is here. Sneak preview. Art Nouveau is up next. And you got to know, there is no way I could even consider rushing Art Nouveau. Oh, clock making really just went into overdrive in the Art Nouveau period. And the clocks are unbelievable. So we are going to break off here with our Victorian grandfather clock. And for those of you who stay with me for the Just Chatting series, I'll see you at 8 o'clock tonight. For those of you who are just into the thrifting and the vintage decor retrospectives, I will see you next weekend. But whatever the case, have a terrific day, and we're going to take a slideshow on the way out.